Ah, uh, what could have been? This sequence here, the eye pulling out sequence, is probably one of the creepiest, weirdest scenes uh, in a cartoon I've ever seen. Uh, you know, for for mainstream TV. <laughs> and we didn't want to play it very gratuitous, so we played it off on shadows. <laughs> and I think it worked. Uh, I think it really shocked kids. A lot of kids uh, were freaked out by this. And uh, you know what? I was actually freaked out when I saw it come back. <laughs> and it got worse with each step. You know, you first see the story. You read the script, and you're like, ooh. And then you uh, do the storyboard, and it's like, oh, good Lord. And then there's an animatic where you get to see it all moving, and you're like, boy, that is really creepy. But, boy, once it comes back animated, you get all the sound effects on and all the voice effects. It just really is sick. Very contrary to the average way that animation writing works these days. The sort of spookiness and creepiness in this cartoon is very reminiscent of older things from the 20s or 30s. After World War II, I think people never wanted to see horrible things anymore. See enough horror through the war and the Depression. Gretchen. We love the Gretchen character. She came back... Uh, later on several times. This sequence here at the end got sort of uh, muddled. Uh, I had boarded this sequence, and uh, I originally had added a joke uh, where that squirrel leaps onto a power line and then goes off and, you know, Keith grabs a transformer and he blows up. We had to change into this for New York. Um, the girl floating above the city was uh, Jonan's idea. <laughs> Nanozim, uh, great episode. Um, Jonan and Rob wrote the script again. I think when Jonan and Rob wrote scripts and, and Rob really could get his way to sort of structure them, they were really wonderful. Uh, another Murray and Menke board. I had boarded this uh, sucking thing here. I remember having to do it. It was very fun to come up with such ex extreme positions on that head as he sucks the cup inside. But uh, this was our greatest 3D challenge. In the whole, in the whole series... Uh, this was really the most footwork. Uh, it's a combo of all sorts of scenes, 2D, 3D, 2D, 3D, uh, still 2D overlays on 3D, still 3D underlays and overlays on 2D. Uh, it just ran the gamut, composing monitors and spaceships and uh, you know backgrounds that move. Uh, and it was a lot of work. It freaked out the entire 3D crew, I think, or at least John Soar, the, the supervisor. It's, there was so much work to do on this, and... It, it was bogging up the whole schedule. Um, the series was very 3D lopsided. We put a lot of 3D into our first six episodes, and then we didn't have as much later on, you know. Uh, I think in our 13th and our 20th, we had a lot of 3D, and that was the end of that. So uh, John suddenly had to do all this 3D very quickly to get the show on the air. And uh, Mary Harrington in New York, they were very upset because they would always see this without 3D scenes put in, and we had no substitute for it. We, we at that point, weren't... Uh, um, thinking adeptly enough to sell the, the show to them in pieces. And I thought they would understand it, so we didn't have animatics spliced into the finished footage where the 3D would lay. And even if we did, I think it would lose them. I, I, they always criticized the show in, in animatic that it just it was too much to follow. Um, they couldn't tell what was happening in the animatic as they saw these board panels rush around. But I know I had faith in the show. I saw what Kyle was doing in the action sequences. I knew where things were moving. Um, and... Uh, and I knew how things were going to come together, but Mary couldn't see it, and nobody trusted me at this point. I don't know if they ever really trusted me through the whole series, but really had to work this out. And when it all came together, everybody was very happy. It's a very good-looking episode and got a lot of acclaim from people. Um, and this also begins Mysterious Mysteries, which we never really saw before. And this opener was used again and again throughout the show. And that's all 3D as well. Uh, just 3D guys doing all these graphics. Uh, I remember just before the episode aired, or not even before it aired, but before it was actually put in the can, it was all animated and sort of put together. It was just ready to roll into the, into the sound. Um, we suddenly, Jonan suddenly came to me and had a big concern. He just couldn't, he thought that kids might get lost because uh, they don't see how Zim shrinks himself down. He just suddenly ends up, in Dib's body, and you then go and see that it's through the, you know, the peas. He's hiding in the peas. 
but he felt that kids might be too lost because they never saw Zim get in the machine, shrink down, and then fly over to the peas. And I told him, I said, we don't need that. I said, kids will understand. This is a pretty common story, a uh, sci-fi story, like inner space or uh, what is that, Fantastic uh, Voyage or whatever. And uh, kids did accept it. Uh, this was actually uh, never a problem with kids. Uh, so I think when it came to later stories, such as Dib's Wonderful Life of Doom, we assumed that kids could make an intelligent leap and understand what happens without having to spell out every little detail of the story. And uh, and there we made our mistake because if it isn't ex- if it isn't one hundred percent obvious or derivative, kids can't understand it. And uh, Nickelodeon, I think, is right in many ways with you know trying to force feed kids because I think that a lot of kids can't make that leap. Some can, but many can't. these ships. We wish we could have done more 3D with those ships. Would have been nice for the exterior. Every time we see the exterior of a ship, it's in 3D. But here you had to do 2D occasionally. But the fun thing, where the animation was a little bit less uh, polished and the film was a little bit less polished in these early episodes, the stories really made up for it. The stories were were really fun and just well-paced and exciting and great. I mean, they, every every show was like a movie. Our sound effects guys actually really criticized us for that. They there were so many sound effects that they had to do for each of these episodes that they uh, they complained this is like doing Star Wars every 11 minutes, and uh, I forget if they won I forget if they won awards for their work on this. I know they got nominated for their work on this series, and the sound house who did this, um, Salami Studios down in North Hollywood, they actually got a lot of work off of this series. Uh, they put it on their reel, and ever since this series came out. A lot of people wanted to work with them. They'd see these shows. They'd see, see their uh, reel with all these bits and pieces of NanoZim in the first episode. And uh, clients would flip out, lose their minds. And uh, they ended up having, by the time we were done this series, they had lots and lots of work. And I bet they still do to this day. Nice guys, too. Uh, I think it's Gary and Joe were the two, uh, the two owners of Salami. So here you go. We start to go into these 3D ships. Again, uh, getting into the 3D ships, a big problem, and that was a big problem on Zim a lot, was uh, things being too divorced from where they're going or what they are, especially with these size differences, like small things uh, in you know big environments. So it takes a lot of footwork to show exactly what is what and what you're looking at and what these small things are and how they relate to their giant environment. <sighs> Very Kyle Menke face on that character. Kyle did all these uh, chase sequences, all the action sequences inside the body. Um, I believe uh, Sean would do all the exterior. Sean was storyboarding all these uh, shots in the uh, living room, all the Dib and Gaz shots, cafeteria shots and stuff before. The music is brilliant. I, I love the music on this. Kevin Manthe built the music throughout this episode, so it became really intense towards the end. And we showed this to everybody uh, at our premiere. We uh, we put on a videotape of this episode, and people were wowed. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was great. We had a huge projection TV. Looking back from the end of the series, it's a little bit primitive, uh, some of the drawings, the layouts, but uh, still a very good show. <laughs> it was really fun to see how this Zim world worked or, you know, how, how the interior of the bodies worked in the Zim world. Kyle Menke had mapped out the, uh, the path through the body that these guys take, and it really doesn't work, actually. I think you have a, what do you have, the spleen or whatever is actually inside the lungs, you know? But still, you know, it doesn't have to be that perfect. It's just fun kids' cartoon sci-fi. <laughs> 